UNUCPR and the Conflict Security and Development Research Group at King's College London. Um, the title of this talk or the, this panel discussion today is Exiting Conflict on a Two-Way Street, Understanding the Relationship Between Individuals Exiting Armed Groups and Their Communities. And a lot of the discussion is going to draw on and focus on um, some of the preliminary findings and the general thinking behind a really interesting UNUCPR project, Managing Exits from Armed Conflict, which I'm going to refer to as MEEC, M-E-A-C. Um, and MEEC is a multi-year collaboration to develop a unified, rigorous approach to examining how and why individuals exit armed conflict and to evaluate the efficacy of interventions meant to support their transition to civilian life. Um, so I'm delighted to, to host this discussion because we have uh, an excellent panel of speakers, including uh, people working on the project and experts working more broadly on this issue um, around DDR and the return of civilians um, into communities. Um, the way the talk is going to work, we're going to have the panel um, panelists present first. They'll go one after the other, um, and then we will open up for a Q&A session. I'd ask you if you've got questions either during the talk or, or when, when the presentations are over to put them into the, the Q&A box that you will see. If you put them into the Q&A box, we'll try to get through as many as we can um, and I'll ask them directly on your behalf. It will save us a bit of time and mean, mean we can get through more. Um, so put your questions there. We'll come to you after the hour is up um, and we'll have 30 minutes for some discussion with the panel. I'm not going to go into detail to introduce each speaker. What I'd rather uh, happen is that each speaker, when they begin their talk, will give you whatever background they need um, to explain their, their role in the project or their research. Um, so I'm just going to go through the, the names of the panelists now and the order in which they'll speak, and then I'll hand over to the first presenter. Um, so the first person that will be speaking will be Gay Gaho um, Burihabwa, um, who is, uh, works on disarmament, demobilization, and reintegration um, in the UN's Department of Peace Operations. Um, he'll be followed by Dr. Siobhan O'Neill, who is the project director of MEEP, um, um, who will then be followed by Crystal Downing, who is going to talk about the Columbia case that she's the manager for. Um, and I should say an extra thanks to Crystal for bringing together this panel today and, and putting a lot of the organizational work in to make this happen. Crystal will then be followed by um, Kato van Brokhoven, who's a project manager on MEEC, and we'll talk about some of the very preliminary findings of the project and what this might indicate. And then last but not least, Dr. Randolph Rea, who's a DDR specialist based in the FBA, is gonna talk about some of his research, some of his extensive research um, prior to this project and how all of this fits together and, and perhaps what this means and, and, and what we can do with some of these findings. So without further ado, um, Dr. Burihabwa, I'll hand over to you um, and I will mute myself. Thank you very much, Kieran, um, and thank you very much um, to the co-organizers for having me join this panel. I'm, I'm very happy to be part of this discussion today. And maybe just to briefly further elaborate on, um, on my own um, current role. So as uh, Kieran stated, I'm working with the um, United Nations on DDR. I'm the coordinator of the Department of Peace Operations uh, for the 26 member interagency working group on DDR. So working a lot on the at the policy level, um, in addition to um, uh, support to DDR field components um, as well. Um, at the same time, I also have the acad academic uh, background, having uh, done some research on the transformation of um, former rebel movements to governing political parties in the African Great Lakes region. And of course, DDR was also a central um, uh, played a central role in, in, in that um, uh, regard as well. So I'm coming into this discussion having a policy lens, but also a, an academic lens. Um, I'm not part of the MIAC project, but I'm uh, very familiar with, with uh, Siobhan and her team and the work they've been doing over the past few years. Um, I thought that since a lot of the participants today are students that are currently following a seminar on um, DDR, more generically, um, um, I thought it would make sense that I maybe start off with um, an, a, a brief acknowledgement of the conceptual evolution that DDR has gone through over the past um, decade. Um, this is due to the fact that um, looking at some of the current research on DDR, but also listening to policymakers and practitioners um, that work on peace and security, but not specifically on DDR, um, you quickly realize that the, the way the term DDR is used in that context is um, refers to um, traditional sequence DDR programs that can be implemented um, uh, in post-conflict settings when certain preconditions are in place. 
these uh, preconditions being um, a peace agreement, trust in the peace process by concerned parties, a willingness of formal belligerents to engage in DDR, as well as a minimum degree of security. Now, looking at um, where UN peace operations are deployed um, uh, currently, and uh, including with the DDR mandate, you will quickly realize that um, you, you hardly have a context where these preconditions are actually in place. Um, so as a result, we've seen over the past 10 years, um, more innovative approaches being developed by DDR practitioners that have, been con that have continued to be deployed in these conflict um, in these complex conflict settings um, where the preconditions for DDR program are not in place. Then as a result, um, the UN Interagency Working Group on DDR has recently um, consolidated these um, innovations and, 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 and new approaches um, through the revision of the integrated DDR standards, the IDDRS, which are the UN's policy doctrine on DDR. They were originally published in 2006 and, were, and the revised wor version was launched in November 2019. Within these revised um, uh, integrated DDR standards, um, there is a new UN approach um, to DDR that is uh, um, outlined. And within this um, new UN approach, um, we, we now speak about a integrated DDR process, which maintains um, traditional DDR programs as one key element um, where the preconditions um, are in place. These can still be implemented. However, there are two new elements that now consist, uh, that now um, uh, are, that are now part of this um, integrated DDR process. The first element are so-called DDR related tools, uh, which can be implemented before, during, or after a DDR program, um, especially when the preconditions are not in place and they comprise um, uh, initiatives such as uh, DDR support to mediation processes. Um, there is also community violence reduction, um, transition weapons and ammunition management, and also support to transitional security arrangements. And the third element that uh, is now part of this, this new UN approach to DDR is reintegration support in the absence of a DDR program, meaning reintegration support that can be provided to individuals that decide to leave active armed groups during ongoing conflict. Two additional points that are worth highlighting when it comes to this um, new approach is that the, the scope of DDR now goes beyond um, post-conflict settings and, and, and settings where P, UN peace operations are deployed and uh, basically are applicable across the entire peace uh, continuum, um, including in what the UN refers to as non-mission settings, basically settings where the UN may have a country team in place, but there is no fully-fledged peace operation uh, deployed. And the second point is that um, there is really an emphasis on the fact that DDR should not be seen as a technical process and an end to itself. DDR ought to be anchored in a broader political strategy because DDR as such is um, highly political. And I think this last point is a good segue then to my first um, uh, point on reintegration, which is at the heart of, of, of today's discussion, which is that um, the reintegration is um, only likely to, to be successful if the causes and, and the reasons why individuals decided to take up arms are actually um, addressed. And um, so regardless of how good a, reintegr a reintegration program may be designed, if these root causes and grievances are not being tackled, then reintegration is not going to be successful. And I think an important point to make here is that reintegration as a standalone intervention will not be able to address many of these factors. So um, when we talk about reintegration, then there is a need to make sure that uh, reintegration in DDR as, as a whole are basically um, plugged into a broader, um, comprehensive uh, political conflict resolution um, approach in order to be successful. And they can actually also contribute to this. To this. So they're, they're, on the one hand, reintegration is dependent of such an approach, but it can also contribute um, to a successful overarching um, uh, conflict resolution approach. The, the second point, um, and this is related to, to, to the first point, is that reintegration in itself is a multidimensional um, uh, approach, uh, which ranges from political to social, economic, and other um, uh, uh, aspects. And while there is usually a lot of attention paid to the socioeconomic dimension of reintegration, 
I would just want to highlight a, a, a an additional um, uh, dimension that um, I have come to to appreciate as a key um, key aspect to to be looked at, um, both through my work here in the UN, but also through my research, and that is the psychological uh, dimension of reintegration. Um, during my my own PhD research, I um, realized that for many individuals, the hardest part about reintegration into reintegrating back into their home communities was dealing with the legacy of having lived through the realities of rebellion. And this was not necessarily um, the, the experience of, of combat fighting you know, against the enemy at the front lines, but it was actually everyday life in the rebellion and the individual and collective vulnerabilities uh, stemming from that. Um, horrible things happen, uh, it, it, in, at least in the case that I studied the same the next day um, uh, in Burundi, um, from internal killings and massacres, um, sexual exploitation and abuse. Um, these are all internal things. So it's, 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 it's really just everyday life and, and things to cope with. And also the coping strategies that um, uh, individuals would develop to deal with that um, uh, would not necessarily be, be helpful, um, but certainly very human, um, uh, including substance abuse, um, et cetera. So as part of reintegration programming, um, I believe there needs to be a very strong um, component looking at psychosocial support for the individuals um, that are returning to communities, but also for community members. And um, even where such support has been granted, my sense is that there's been a lot of focus on the rank and file, but actually this, this psychosocial support needs to encompass the entire, the entirety of the movement, including the movement's leadership. And of course it gets challenging if you're now talking in the post-conflict, you know, it, when, when this political leadership becomes you know, the government in a post-conflict setting. It's very challenging then to talk about psychosocial support, et cetera, but I, I do believe that it is necessary. Um, the third point uh, I would like to make is actually related to the socioeconomic reintegration. Um, and the, the, the key um, observation here is that so, socioeconomic reintegration approaches need to be more innovative and better tailored to the econo economic realities um, in the whole, in the communities to which um, uh, ex-combatants will be returning, and I would like to give one example um, where this has not necessarily been the case, which is the DRC. I've been working a lot on the DRC, and for the past twenty years, as part of DDR uh, programming, uh, we've trained ex-combatants in carpentry, masonry, animal husbandry, hairdressing, etc. And apart from the fact that there's only so many hairdressers that that any given community could absorb. These um, skill sets have not necessarily matched the economic realities in Eastern DRC, which, um, as uh, you may know, are to a large ex extent um, shaped by the exploitation of natural resources and artisanal um, mining. So um, while this mismatch um, of skills and economic realities is one of the reasons why uh, scholars have detected um, a phenomenon which they've um, referred to as the revolving door, whereby DDR, former DDR beneficiaries end up rejoining armed groups. Um, a recent uh, project by IOM has also detected another dynamic whereby active combatants leave armed groups and seek livelihood opportunities on, by, the, by themselves um, in artisanal mining sites that are not under control of um, armed groups. So if the combatants themselves are seeking livelihood opportunities in these in this sector, then surely if we are there to support reintegration, then we need to look at that sector. And it is problematic. Um, of course, the whole phenomenon of war economies, et cetera, is, is something that um, is, is certainly challenging to deal with, but certainly it, it is worthwhile to ex at least explore opportunities um, in this sector. So um, just one example um, uh, pointing to the fact that we probably need to be more bold, more inno innovative when we're looking at socioeconomic reintegration uh, opportunities. And finally, um, and linked to this, um, the, the, the fourth point I would like to make is that uh, we shouldn't, you know, our approaches to reintegration should not underestimate or even undermine the agency of the individuals um, themselves, the individuals that leave armed groups um, 
to um, uh, return to the communities, but also members within the community, within the receiving communities. Um, so the point here is that if you, if we are looking at, you know, re ideal reintegration approaches or effective reintegration approaches, then certainly they should be designed in a way that this agency um, is not just acknowledged, but fostered um, and, and, and basically becomes the, the core element of the um, uh, overall reintegration um, support that, that we are, we are um, aiming to provide. So um, I'll leave it here for now. Um, uh, and I'm looking very much looking forward to any questions you may have and also to a fruitful discussion. Thank you very much. All right, I think I'm up next. Um, I'm Siobhan O'Neill, and I'm the project director of the Managing Exits from Armed Conflict Project at UN University Center for Policy Research. Um, for those of you not familiar with UNU, we are a constellation of think tanks in the UN system. We're kind of a strange UN entity because we are a, a UN partner, but we have academic independence in our charter. So it's really our job to try to bring the best scholarship from the academy into the policy making and uh, program design implementation um, discussions and process. Uh, the project that, that Crystal and Kato and I work on uh, is trying to really understand the impact of various UN supported interventions that help people exit armed conflict. So including DDR, including child or community reintegration, um, a defectors program, any of the type of, of interventions where we're trying to help individuals, groups, and, and entire communities uh, separate from conflict, stand down and return to civilian life. Um, despite working in this space for a long time, we don't have a a lot of uh, strong evidence for what type of interventions work and when and under which conditions. Um, I come to this project formerly as, as someone who worked in counterterrorism um, and uh, did my PhD on uh, when countries negotiate with terrorist groups. But I think this has been really interesting working in a space is sort of moving away from not necessarily that sort of the high level sort of policy uh, intervention, but really the lived experience. And it, it's a term I really like, and, and Randolph um, says it often. And so I think this is a great point to start with, which is, you know, we talk about reintegration, meaning a program that the UN supports, but then there is a reintegration, not necessarily even process, but a reintegration transition, that lived experience of the individual or the community um, of, of moving away from an armed group or from armed conflict, and transitioning to a life that is not oriented to that group or to that conflict, a civilian life, if you will. Um, and in this, I think it's really important that we acknowledge that this is a two-way street. This does not happen in a vacuum, right? So as much as you may have um, a really well thought out program that, that's well supported, um, that's responsive, that, that addresses the agency of each individual, it's not just up to the individual. Um, it's up to the community that will accept or not accept them back, right? And I think there's sort of three points you made here. So one, understanding this is a two-way street. Um, I think so, first of all, we need to contextualize the process of an individual against that of the community. So let's just say, for instance, um, some of the things we're interested in better understanding are people's, uh, the norms they embrace around the use of violence. Is it justifiable to engage in violence to pursue your goals? Um, regardless of the fact that it's illegal or that it would hurt other people. Um, if we ask an ex-combatant or someone who had been associated with an armed group that question, and they say, yes, it's permissible, we can't see that in a vacuum. You have to understand what the community um, would answer as well, right? Because these communities have also been impacted by violence. The norms around the use of violence have changed with the conflict. So we cannot see the individual, we cannot expect the individual to reintegrate, to make that transition fully and permanently without understanding the community has to meet them halfway at least. Um, and we cannot sort of uh, evaluate that individual's transition alone in a vacuum. We have to situate it in what's happening in the community. And I think there's two other key points to mention here. One um, is that the UN increasingly works in places where we don't necessarily have a peace process or we have ongoing fighting. Um, and so the problem that you have is that, you know, reintegrate people into what? 
right? So if we're talking about taking people out of an armed group and then just putting them into a civilian context that is completely ravaged by war, where the economy is still oriented towards the conflict, where everyone is affiliated for protection, do we have a realistic ex, you know, expectation that they would stay out of conflict? And I think related to that is this discussion around community mobilization. We still really think about this in individual terms, but in many of the conflicts um, where the UN supports programming, you have entire communities that either mobilize um, their own self-defense group or they align with another group, including groups that get listed as terrorist, and it's not necessarily because they're buying into an ideology or anything like that. It's often part of a protection scheme for that community. But the entire community is oriented to that conflict and affiliated with this group. And so even when you think about children, young children, they don't necessarily have the ability to make an individual decision to stand down or to sit out, right? This is something that happens at a community level. So I think that's something we need to think about in this discussion about the role of community in reintegration. My next point is really about this process, this reintegration transition that individuals go through. Um, especially now that we have so many groups that are listed and kind of part of this discussion about how you reintegrate people, um, there is very much the political expectation that your, your exit from an armed group occurs like this, as they would say in the US, cold turkey. It's, a, it's an event, right? It's not a process. But from what we know, certainly from exiting gangs and other kinds of violent groups, this is something that's a transition. It's a transition full of fits and starts, right? And imagine you're in a, in a conflict affected society. You can imagine a lot of things that would trip you up as you are trying, you know, really earnestly sort of trying to separate yourself. So I think this is something to remember. We, the UN and others who work in this space think about DDR and reintegration as a short term humanitarian intervention. But the process of exiting an armed group or distancing yourself from conflict is likely a process that takes quite a while. And it's one full of fits and starts. It's not likely to happen on a singular, a single day. So we maybe have a mismatch between the process we're trying, the individual process we're trying to support and the types of programs that we run. So how do we, how do we address that? And I think part of the answer is potentially um, the community. And I think that happens for a lot of reasons. One, one of the lessons we have learned in this space is that uh, really targeted programs on ex-combatants can backfire because it creates a lot of resentment in the community for people who are seen as having been involved in violence and then receiving um, benefits from the international community. So finding that balance um, sort of in child education, one of the, the takeaways has always been about a matching or doing a community oriented program. So it's not just those children who are affiliated, it's the broader um, a group of children who have been impacted by the community or investing in parts of the community to try to help everyone. So I think there's sort of that component here as well, which is thinking about investing in the community, not only to reduce any frustration that there might be because of the support for people coming out of conflict, um, but also to invest in a community that also needs to transition with those individuals. Um, and I think here, this is, this is one of those sort of last points I'll make, which is, um, you know, we think about these programs very much sort of coming top down, but if we're going to sort of bridge this nexus and kind of think long-term about we, how providing support to communities and individuals who are trying to transition away from conflict, we have got to find a way to probably embed this support to build capacity at um, the local level. And so, you know, the UN or others won't be there within a certain period of time, um, but those individuals still may need help. We, we worked on a project a few years ago on children um, and their involvement with armed groups. And we worked with a former child soldier in Sierra Leone who went back and interviewed eight other um, former child soldiers and asked them how they were doing 15 years after uh, they demobilized. And what was interesting is many of them had had support and they'd had job training programs. Um, they had had uh, livelihood interventions, but they reached a point where they just couldn't proceed any further in their careers. Um, and part of that problem is that it was, a, it was a community that was very oriented towards a mentorship kind of model and they had no mentors, 
right? They, they had had a, a, a funded program, which was helpful, but it only got them so far because it just wasn't embedded into the way the economy was built, into what trades were built in, in that society. And so I think it's a good sort of takeaway to think about how do we, how do we uh, build up those organizations, those capacities where people will have to rely on support? How do you lay, I think, um, sort of the, the acceptance um, the communication sort of framework around people coming back. So there's a real investment that needs to happen in the community. And I think that there has been movements in that space, but that's certainly an area we probably have to explore more for, for long-term um, effective reintegration. Um, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleagues, but just to say that the project that we're working on is very much trying to get towards that evidence base to really understand what it means um, what it means in different contexts to fully and sustainably exit an armed conflict and how we can actually measure that progress over time. So I look forward to hopefully coming back and uh, to this forum and maybe updating you as we have even more data, but I'm excited for Crystal and Katso to tell you a little bit about what we're doing in, in two of the contexts where we're applying this uh, approach. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Crystal Downing. I'm the Columbia Case Study Manager for um, the MAAC project. Uh, I'm also lucky enough to be Karen's advisee in the PhD um, program in War Studies at King's. Um, so I'm really happy to be today, here today um, to present some of our um, Columbia uh, plans for, for the managing exits from armed conflict research and also some, some very early findings from, from some of the interviews that we've been doing so far. Um, so I'm just going to share my screen. Um, let's see. Okay. Um, so um, MAAC in Colombia has, has a few different upcoming um, plans for, for different research methods that we're going to be rolling out over the next few weeks and months. Um, we're, we're doing ongoing desk research and stakeholder interviews to try and understand kind of the background to DDR in Colombia. Um, and some of the decision making that has been going on over the last 20 and more years um, in, in Colombia through different peace processes and, and demobilizations. Um, over the next few weeks, we're rolling out a phone survey of about 2000 community members in nine conflict affected um, and urban communities across Colombia. Um, we're also planning to do a survey of community leaders and surveys with uh, approximately 200 former combatants in both the reintegration and the FARC specific reincorporation processes. Um, and then we'll be doing some qualitative, uh, some qualitative work as well to kind of delve a little bit deeper into um, to different issues and, and talk to different kind of subgroups within the reintegrating population. So um, Afro-Colombian indigenous groups, women, children, um, people with disabilities, um, and, and others uh, will all be involved in, in, the, in the qualitative work. Um, and we're hoping later in the year to do some participatory work with some more kind of visual, non-traditional methodologies to, especially with young people um, affected by conflict to kind of, uh, kind of get some different um, expressions of, of the factors that are affecting their, their daily lives um, and especially their daily lives for the daily lives of those who are, who are integrating after, after spending time associated with armed groups. Um, we're also hoping to do some social media analytics, um, which will hopefully kind of draw on some of these themes, especially in Colombia at the moment, where transitional justice processes and, and others are kind of very happening in, you know, very much in the public eye and, and bringing out some of the topics that, that we'll be discussing, or we are discussing here today, um, really into the public conversation. So, so we're hoping to use social media analytics to, to kind of analyze how, how those conversations are playing out online. So um, the, so far um, in the research with, with stakeholders, um, we've interviewed uh, practitioners, um, members of the government and FARC negotiating teams from, from the recent uh, peace process, um, and people who were involved in an, in an earlier um, process with the AUC paramilitary groups from 2003 to 2006. Um, to really try and understand how um, how decisions were made, how kind of top down policy making um, has affected DDR design and implementation over over the last twenty or so years in Colombia, and there are three themes that have have really come out um, so far in in this part of the research. The first is that DDR design elements that aim to ensure group cohesion, um, which is something that in Colombia has particularly interested guerrilla groups over time who are ent entering politics. 
um, can actually have the opposite groups, uh, opposite effects and push individuals out of um, the political party and, and out of the reincorporation process. Um, so, so especially in the case of the FARC, just to provide a kind of a, an example here, they, they really saw the reincorporation of the FARC rank and file as being almost synonymous with um, membership in the political party. And so the, the decision making has been so far very much top down um, made by the political leadership who are part of a, a national reincorporation council. Um, and, and over time, um, some of the decisions that have been made and, and, and kind of the kind of faults and weaknesses in the process of, of policy making have resulted in delays around reincorporation. And that's been very frustrating, I think, for, for some of the rank and file. So these three quotes, I think, illustrate some of the different perspectives. The first is Andres Garcia, who was a member of the FARC, uh, of, I'm sorry, of the government negotiating team um, during the FARC um, process from 2012, 2016. And he said they originally wanted to maintain the cohesion of the guerrilla base. And I understand that logic, but it's turned out to be counterproductive for those same purposes. A lot of people could have felt connected to the party without their reincorporation process, depending on the party. Um, and I think the, 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 next, the next quote really kind of highlights the effects of, of that emphasis on group cohesion and the fact that this has caused frustration among, um, among many ex-combatants. So this is a, a quote from a, from a former rank and file member of the FARC um, in 2019, who said, we want to decentralize reincorporation and the productive projects because decisions are being made by the leadership of a party that does not represent us and that abandoned its guerrilla base a long time ago. Um, and he was part of a, this, this um, former FARC combatant was part of a group that's kind of separated from the formal reincorporation process, formed its own NGO, and is now um, reincorporating quite independently of, of, of government and, and UN supported processes, um, and, and kind of represents an increasing group of, of, uh, of former FARC combatants who are still committed to reincorporation and to, and to moving away from armed group life but are very frustrated with the way that things have been um, implemented over the last few years. And then the last quote is, is from Pastor Alapi, who was a member of the FARC negotiating team and is now on the FARC component of the National Reincorporation Council, who kind of reflects on um, the differences between kind of decision-making in, in within the armed group and now as part of the political party. So our practice was every morning, you do this, you do that. In combat, it was an order. And today we're working with a different logic new experiences, someone to organize in one way, others in another, the party can't be one of only ex guerrillas So the separation of some members is part of that. I'm not worried about it. It's logical to be like that, to adjust the political bases and the leaderships. And um, I think it's important to note here that this is quite, this contrasts quite greatly with other members of the, of the FARC political leadership who are much, still much more kind of concerned with maintaining that cohesion and, and kind of kind of um, that's it, that's that kind of connection between the reincorporation process and the and the political party. So a second theme that's come out so far in the stake, stakeholder interviews is that the the as as Gar has said the you know the DDR is a is a political um, political process and um, and obviously is often discussed and negotiated as part of political and peace and peace processes. Um, but it's that one of the themes that's really coming out is that an an an, over, an overemphasis on on politics and political goals during negotiations by leadership can actually be detrimental to rank and file reintegration because either not enough time is spent um, discussing rank and file reintegration or or. Um, it's not it's not addressed in a in a really kind of comprehensive way. So um, one practitioner who was who was um, involved in the implementation of the AUC um, uh, demobilization and reintegration process said quite simply the negotiation was only for the AUC commanders, and she put that in the context of the rank and file reintegration just really being a second um, a second priority or not a priority at all. Um, and similarly, during the FARC process, um, Andres Garcia kind of highlighted that on the government side, there was a lot of pressure to arrive at an agreement. They were, this was negotiated at the end of four years of, um, of talks. Um, and so there was kind of a, an, a, a political need to arrive at, a, at an agreement. And on the FARC side, there was a lot of emphasis on the political aspects of, um, of reincorporation. So the point on FARC reincorporation was negotiated in a rush. 
that's why it was set out in such a general way and left so many things pending that had to be defined during implementation. Political reincorporation was prioritized. That's what most interested the FARC negotiators. So socioeconomic reincorporation was not well outlined and that gap had implications, delays. And for the government, the pressure to arrive in an agreement was great as well. And then finally, one of the one of the other themes that I'm that I'm kind of exploring in these interviews is the fact that children are often excluded from DDR and policy making processes that actually aim to address their needs. Um, so it's um, it's kind of public knowledge at this point. Children were not discussed at all in the AUC negotiations, um, and in fact, between eleven and fourteen thousand of them were sent home with any without any kind of uh, reintegration support at all. Um, and that, that was after the, the AEC demobilizations from 2003 to 2006. Um, a few years later, um, the various stakeholders in Colombia kind of realized this, this, this mistake and there was an effort called Finding Nemo to, to find some of the, some of the children um, who had been sent home without, um, without reintegration benefits. Um, and that effort resulted in, in, in finding 275 um, of those 11 to 14,000 children. So obviously now, you know, we're, we're around 15 years later, there are potentially, you know, 11 to 14,000 people who, are, who, have, who have just kind of reintegrated on their own. And, and it's really not clear what the impact of that has been. Um, there has been other progress on the inclusion of child, child recruits in, in reintegration, but really it's mostly on paper and, and the practice of it has not, has not moved um, very far past where it was. So what's the impact of, of these kind of weaknesses on communities? I think one of the first points that we're seeing in Colombia is that community services face extra pressure. Um, ex combatants leave reintegration sites um, or reincorporation sites, the ETCR by their Spanish acronym, and they establish new collective settlements in, in communities um, that place pressure on community services, which are already scarce, like water, roads and electricity. Um, you know, you're, you're talking about potentially 100 or more um, people over, over a short period of time arriving in a community and establishing a new settlement. Um, and obviously that impacts um, community services. The same with education. Schools, schools and universities don't have the resources to accept children who are not registered for the reintegration programs um, and adults who, who want to enter universities and, and um, professional training programs. Um, and so that obviously has, has an effect on both the schools and universities themselves and, and also to, to those um, formerly associated children and adults and their access to education. Another point is that communities and ex-combatants face security threats. Um, I think in, in, in both the AUC and the FARC um, processes, we've seen um, kind of faulty DDR leading to um, armed group activity, people refusing to demobilize or, or rapidly returning to, to, um, to armed activity. Um, and this obviously affects both communities broadly and ex-combatants specifically who are facing targeted threats um, by, by their kind of former colleagues in, in the armed groups. And finally, delays in economic reintegration, meaning that communities see less benefits associated with the presence of ex-combatants. So um, whereas you know, economic reintegration productive projects might, might bring employment to the communities if they're well, if they're well supported, in actual fact, if they're if if ex-combatants are reintegrating um, and, and seeking jobs on their own, then, then communities may see it more as, as additional pressure than, than any kind of economic benefit. So now just to, to, um, to talk just very briefly about some of the MEAC um, survey work and the, and the community surveys that we're gonna be rolling out in Colombia. So the, the community survey um, that we have addresses a number of different um, issues from demographics to politics, um, social relationships, security, experiences of conflict, um, climate security, and the impact of COVID on, on all of these kind of um, dynamics. Um, and what we're really trying to do is um, they're very similar topics between the community survey and the ex combatant survey so that we can really compare and see and see the individuals in the context of their communities and, and see kind of what the differences and similarities are between all of their experiences. Um, in the Columbia um, community survey, some additional kind of context specific um, topics that we're going to be addressing. So reincorporation of the FARC within, within broader implementation of the peace agreement in all of its different dimensions. 
um, continued activity by armed and dissident groups. So, so obviously we've got the ELN who's still active the, um, as a guerrilla group, um, continuing the conflict, and and then other criminal groups um, and the FARC dissident groups who are who are continuing as well. Um, community knowledge and perceptions of the peace agreement and dynamics around the presence the presence of Venezuelan migrants and refugees, and the and the kind of outcomes and and experiences that that have been. Um, seen as a result of those factors so far. And then finally, just kind of a note on, um, on MEAC and, and adapting um, the survey to the Colombian context. Um, I think one of the really interesting objectives of, of the project as a whole is to create these tools so that the UN can, um, can really um, rigorously assess its interventions in, in different contexts. And so the, the experience of adapting the, the um, the survey instrument to um, to Colombia is kind of part of the project, and and, and we're going to be we're going to be looking at lessons learned as part of that process. Um, so just to note some of the really interesting um, factors that we've been looking at in in the during the adaptation of the of the survey. So obviously gender, religious and political ideology um, are, are, are different across different contexts, the length of the conflict. So um, our two case studies at the moment are Colombia and Nigeria. In, in Nigeria, you can ask questions about before the conflict in Colombia because it's been going on for 50 plus years, um, it's more difficult. And, and so we've had to think creatively about how to, um, how to address kind of questions that, um, or how to adapt questions that ask people to compare both between a before and an after. Um, climate change and conflict related environmental degradation, because in Colombia we've got, um, there's the, you know, a lot of illegal mining and, and um, deforestation uh, that's associated with armed group activity. Um, and then language, age and COVID related restrictions, which is obviously affecting, affecting research um, all over the world at the moment and, um, and obviously something to take into account. So anyway, I will stop there and I'm, I'm really pleased to, um, to pass over to my colleague Kato, who will tell you a bit about the Nigeria work. Thanks so much, Crystal. This is actually a, a really great setup for um for what I want to present on, on Nigeria, you've done an excellent job in kind of laying out the topics um, of the research and, and we have similar topics in Nigeria, so that's very helpful. I'm also going to share my screen, screen because I want to uh, share some numbers and I think visualizing those will be, um, will be easier. And I should also mention that my neighbor just started snow shoveling right outside. So you, you're getting some free um, sound bites from New York <laughs> in the winter. I apologize if it's if it's distracting. Um, so I just quickly want to present some really, really new and fresh data that's coming out of our research in Nigeria. Um, we're still really mid kind of analyzing this and cleaning this data. So it's, it's really so new that I would ask you <laughs> to not yet quote or reference any numbers. We'll, we'll publish these soon uh, once, once they're finalized. Um, so very specifically, we did a phone survey uh, in December and January in Borno State in Northeast Nigeria, a phone survey on community experiences and, and perspectives on the conflict. Um, I should mention that this survey was done in partnership with Dr. Rebecca Littman, who's at the University of Illinois at Chicago, and Dr. Zoe uh, Marks, who's at uh, Harvard Kennedy School. Um, we had 3,173 respondents, men, women, children, kind of across the metropolitan area of, of Maiduguri, which is a, which is a city um, with a very high level of, of displacement. So a lot of respondents coming, coming from outside Maiduguri. Um, the topics, I think Crystal actually already did a really great job in outlining some of the topics. It's very similar. So norms and perceptions around violence, in conflict, victimization, um, acceptance of former members of armed groups, so that, that's Boko Haram, but also self-defense groups like the CJTF, Yangora, and a few others. We had questions around COVID, um, questions around climate change. And I think for this specific presentation, I, I really just only want to pull out a few, specifically on victimization and exposure to violence, then a few on kind of perceptions around acceptance and, and experiences with people coming back, um, just a few key things that I think will connect very nicely to the presentations of Kaho, Shaval, and, and then Crystal. So very quickly, just to start with um, victimization and kind of exposure to conflict. Um, as you can see here, the respondents really 
um, really displayed a very high level of, of experience with the conflict and exposure to the conflict. The blue bars represent experience of the respondents themselves, and then the orange bars, those were questions about close relatives. So, for example, almost 2.5% of the respondents were ever abducted by Boko Haram themselves. And when we asked if they had close relatives abducted by Boko Haram, this was close to 28%, so really pretty high levels. The same, we asked uh, if they were ever beaten, tortured, or shot as a result of the conflict, that's 21%. But then if we ask about close relatives, that goes up to 57.65%. Um, to, to and one very important thing to mention there, actually, we, we asked the follow-up questions on the perpetrators um, of these acts. And, for example, with the beaten, tortured, or shot questions, I think about 65% said that they were beaten, tortured, or shot, or their close relatives were beaten, tortured, or shot by Boko Haram. But about 36% said this was by the by the military. And so that's that's really significant to point out. I think this connects a little bit to what Kaho was saying about addressing root causes and grievances in a conflict, especially in, in a conflict in Northeast Nigeria, where you're trying to reintegrate people coming out of armed groups while the conflict is still is still ongoing. Um, you can also see that there's very high levels of displacement. 68% had to leave their community because of, of the conflict. And out of those, about half of, half of those have not returned uh, to, to their community at the moment of surveying them. This connects a little bit also, I think, Gao, to, to what you were saying about psychological effects um, for, for former combatants, of course, but also for, for community members, right? So that's really the question is, here is how, how do these experiences impact kind of the acceptance and the, the preparedness to welcome people back uh, come out of town groups. On the flip side, association also seems quite um, common and high. So we asked people if they were ever with an armed group or force, even just for one day. And you can see here that I think roughly a little bit under 5% said that they were ever with Boko Haram. Um, we expect this number to be um, to be a little bit higher. You can see that the refuse to answer response on this question was, was close to 18%, um, but still significant numbers admitted to having been with an armed group. And I think this is really a very uh, relevant thing to take into, into account when you're designing reintegration programs in a setting where you have that ongoing conflict. I mean, Siobhan talked about this, right? Into what are we reintegrating um, people, especially if you have armed groups who are recruiting, um, who are recruiting still. Uh, Gao talked a little bit about those kind of existing grievances as well. Um, so I think this is a very interesting point. I also think that we need to be a bit mindful of the fluidity of association and, um, and whether it is related at all to absence in the community or not. I think from the outside, we and I do this as well, we talk a lot about welcoming people back in the community, but uh, this idea of going away and then coming back, I'm not sure if that's often really what's going on in reality. Um, now I quickly want to run you through some questions. These are these are really quite interesting. So we asked people if they if they knew anyone, if they knew people abducted by Boko Haram, and if they knew people uh, who came back to the community. And then if they said yes, we asked, did you welcome them back? And if they said no, we asked, would you welcome them back? And really across the board, you can see that the perceptions around this, the the hypothetical. Um, the levels of acceptance are, are much lower than, than kind of in reality. So would you welcome them back? 60% says yes. Did you welcome them back? 88% says yes. So these are really quite high numbers. We asked this of people abducted by Boko Haram and also we asked about people who willingly joined Boko Haram. And so here you see lower numbers, but still a significant uptake between would you and did you. So it does seem like in reality, people are um, accepting those who were with Boko Haram back in their communities. We then asked the same question about close relatives. Um, and so again, you see the same trend. Would you welcome them back? It's pretty high actually for relatives who were abducted by Boko Haram, 76%. Then did you, it goes up to 83%. And I, I do wanna be very clear that the, the concerns around stigma are, are real. Uh, there were legitimate concern you can see in the did you welcome them back? 14% said no. That's that's actually pretty pretty high, right? So I think we also have some emerging evidence from other surveys 
we're doing in, in Northeast Nigeria that really suggests that there are some very real concerns around certain groups. Uh, for example, women who come back to their communities with children that they didn't used to have um, before they went into the armed group. So ju just to point out that there, that there is a real concern here. Um, we asked about close relatives who willingly joined. And so again, you see kind of the same, actually this one goes up significantly from, from 55 to in the, in the 80%. And it's interesting because the, the number from close relatives who were abducted to who joined willingly goes from 76 to 55% in the green. Um, but with the did you questions, it goes from 83 to, um, to 80. So that's only a 3% uh, difference between did you welcome back uh, family members who were abducted versus who willingly joined. Um, one very quick final point, just to end on kind of a positive note, we asked if people had heard any uh, stories about returning Boko Haram um, associates who had been good community members. 35% said yes. And when we asked about negative stories, only 13% said yes. So all of these numbers, um, again, these are tentative emerging findings, but, but I do think that the broader point here is that, that um, communities are open to accepting people who come back uh, from, from Boko Haram, and they have indeed been doing so. We'll soon, as I said, these are emerging, we'll soon be publishing a lot more kind of short findings briefs. So uh, for those who are interested in this, definitely keep an eye on the UNU CPR uh, website. We're also doing a lot of other surveys. Um, we're rolling out surveys with people who were formerly associated, other community member surveys. Um, we have a survey with community leaders that's currently ongoing and we already have one findings report on that one on the, on the website. Um, so this is really just to give you a, a little taste of what we're currently doing in in Nigeria, and I look forward to the to the discussion. Over to Randolph, I think. Yeah, fantastic. Uh, what a pleasure to be able to follow all of some of my favorite uh, colleagues here, uh, and a challenge to be the anchor to uh, round out uh, the presentation part of this uh, seminar. Um, but hopefully what I can do is I can, you know, circle back around, connect some of the different ideas that we've got here uh, and tie it all in a neat little package. Um, but the clock is ticking, so I'll get going. Um, I think this is a great opportunity. I really wanted to jump back to, you know, taking off my policy hat, taking off my advising uh, uh, processes in the field hat and jump back to some more academically oriented work that I did in the past. Um, and work that I think in its own small way is maybe some of a precursor to some of the work that the team at UNU is doing now with the MIAC project in, in its own small way. And why I'm so excited and supportive about the project that they have now taking the whole premise of doing these big studies, uh, comparing across countries, taking it to a whole nother level. Um, so I'll give you a little bit of very brief background on some of my work. Uh, I wanna focus on a few micro issues about uh, the lived experience of reintegration, as uh, Siobhan uh, mentioned, and then maybe zoom out to some of the macro questions about what does this all mean for the successes and failures of, of DDR and reintegration uh, support. Um, so background, uh, this research was taken undertaken during a time when I was working for the World Bank. Uh, I was working mostly on monitoring and evaluation of reintegration support. And the main focus of that being, you know, we're spending literally hundreds of millions of dollars on reintegration support across, uh, in this instance, I was working in the Great Lakes region of Africa. So across the five countries in the Great Lakes region, we are spending hundreds of millions of dollars on reintegration support. Were we getting anything for it? Was this having an effect? Uh, was really the question we were trying to answer all the time. But kind of paradoxically, we very rarely spent any time looking at you know, the kind of underlying uh, social, political, and economic pro processes that individuals themselves navigate as they transition from a life as a combatant to a civilian. Um, so we had a very poor kind of understanding of what we were even trying to observe. Um, uh, so I, I wanted to go try to take a stab at trying to figure out what I could about this. Um, so, 
you know, very briefly, working from long longitudinal data from across, you know, maybe a five-year period from five countries, about uh, 10,000 uh, respondents, both ex-combatant and community members, um, about 1,000 data points on each respondent. If you got some quick maths there, you have a sense that there's a lot of data, quite rich. Um, and I'll leave that there. So if I jump to a few kind of micro insights on some of these processes, I think one of the first things that really actually took me a while to appreciate, because it's something we often assume is true, is this idea that, yes, there is actually a huge amount of evidence to support the idea that ex-combatants start the process of reintegration at a huge disadvantage uh, to the communities to which they return. Um, and this is in almost every, you know, every one of the thousand measurable aspects, you know, uh, we were looking at. Um, and maybe if we try to put some kind of umbrella over this and, and kind of make it neat how to think about these kinds of disadvantages, a lot of them are, you can associate with what I call missed opportunities. Missed opportunities for a normal education trajectory, skills development, socialization, uh, social networking, and et cetera, all these things that we do in the normal course of a life uh, that provide the foundation for where we are later on. Um, so individuals who have been in armed groups, you know, have often missed a large portion of those kind of foundational processes. Um, and this is especially acute for those who are mobilized into armed groups under the age of 18. And the further you slide down that scale of uh, of, of the, the younger the age at recruitment, the more acute these problems are. Um, but what does it all translate to when we start talking about, okay, how do people start navigating, ex-combatants start navigating uh, these processes of reintegration? Um, and I think there's kind of maybe two main stories or narratives that I want to focus in on here. First, economically, and then, you know, a social component of them. Um, because it was really clear uh, that in the Great Lakes region, there was kind of some predominantly identifiable patterns uh, that we were able to draw out and see that there were some processes happening. And one of these kind of reintegration pathways or processes uh, that individuals were undertaking was really based around uh, small scale business or wage labor to the extent that wage labor even exists in, in these contexts. And keep in mind, when we talk about, you know, uh, small business, this could be you know, a stall at the market selling staple goods. This could be, uh, you know, a small carpentry business. This could be, um, you know, selling watered out gasoline on the side of the road. Uh, all of that, you know, could fall within that category. And really the, the forms of support that were most useful that really showed uh, evidence of kind of triggering a positive uh, trajectory here were around skills and education. That we saw that those ex-combatants who received skills and education support were more likely uh, to have improved income and savings through, you know, through a uh, small business or wage labor, uh, that this translated to increased uh, food and housing security, and that all of this could in, uh, affect uh, an increased perception of self-empowerment, the ability to affect change in one's life, and that that was correlated with uh, stronger success in access to uh, formal credit, um, which, all of this, you know, starts being a positive cycle um, that was really observably, you know, propelling some ex-combatants uh, upwards. Another version of this story is one that's really based around um, uh, um, subsistence or small-scale agriculture, um, where, again, the key factor here is access to arable land, uh, that those who have, you know, access to arable land have greater food and housing security, have greater income and savings, if they're really successful, that can feed back into their food and housing security, and even in some instances, feed back into uh, access to arable land, right? Moving beyond subsistence into a small scale uh, production. Now, I've just elaborated the kind of positive versions of these, of these two loops, but there's a flip side, right? There's those who do not have uh, the skills and education uh, to get into being successful in, uh, wage labor or small business. There are those who do not have access to arable land or are not able to um, activate that kind of pathway. And if we try to look at what is the big factor that separates those who are successful in these two pathways, which I should briefly note, the most 
the most successful individuals are those in the Great Lakes region were those who combined these two pathways, right? Especially given that growing in large parts of the season can, um, large parts of the area can be seasonal, right? So there's a combined livelihood strategy. But really jumping back, who's successful and who's not? One of the key factors we found were those who are more socially connected are the ones who are more successful in either of these pathways, right? Social connections. And it's not so difficult to understand why. If we think about um, small business, for example, a wage labor really wasn't a big part of this, really small business. Um, you know, I reflect back on some of my early experiences um, uh, working at a demobilization site, site in South Sudan. And being in a market outside of the demobilization site, and you know, kind of eight stalls were in the middle of nowhere in South Sudan. And I was kind of like, well, every stall, he, everybody here is selling the exact same thing. They're selling the same bag of maize, some soap, some other basic staple goods. They're all selling it at the basically the rock bottom price that they can sell it for. How do you decide which stall you're gonna buy at? Well, you know, you 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 go to the person you know. So social connections, uh, you know, are our access to both tangible and intangible resources. Um, and in this instance, it was really a, a matter of fact that uh, those who had stronger social connections were able to get a greater market share there to, to really make that livelihood happen. Likewise, in these kinds of contexts in the Great Lakes region, we're talking about a setting where access to arable land is almost entirely socially mediated. Uh, it's really about familial structures, inheritance, um, which has some very uh, particular gendered aspects in that often women do not are not able to inherit land, which creates some blockages to certain uh, pathways for for women. Uh, and there's a whole, we could spend hours just talking about the gender dimensions of this. But ultimately, this idea that social connections, social integratedness is key to economic success uh, and to the experience, the lived experience of reintegration overall. So, well, how do we build social connections? How successful are ex-combatants at doing that? Um, well, what we see is very clear that those who are able to build trust and acceptance within familial networks as a symbol of acceptance within the community are able to leverage these familial networks towards broader communal networks. Uh, and it's those communal networks that are really the ones that are more important uh, for the economic outcomes. Um, and this is, this is super interesting, uh, looking at this, we see that it's really clear that those who it's possible for individuals to make broader communal networks without family support, but they, it's not as likely. Um, so I think this is something that's more and more well recognized is that, you know, in many reintegration settings, it's really the family that bears the onus of responsibility, the brunt of support for for ex-combatants, but in many settings, many ex-combatants are returning to uh, uh, communities where they do not have uh, familial networks that can support them, and it's a huge disadvantage going into reintegration. Um, so there are so many things I would love to talk about on these micro aspects, but I want to make sure I just briefly get to some more macro reflections. Um, and this is just you know a teaser, but I think ultimately what I want to get the message here to be is that the social and economic aspects are deeply intertwined, deeply complex, inseparable. Um, that it's, it almost becomes meaningless to even talk about them as separate things because they are one and the same. Uh, so let's jump out macro picture. Um, so, you know, I'd spent, you know, some time uh, developing, you know, more or less a model of reintegratedness. And my boss said, okay, well, what can this do for us? We still have to, you know, figure out, um, you know, what's been successful and what hasn't. Um, but with this kind of uh, model, there was, an, uh, there was the opportunity to start looking at, okay, well, I've been looking at individuals. Um, what if we start looking at groups? We can look at, you know, demographic groups, all kinds of insights there, geographic communities, how do people in different geographies do? Or we could even start looking at the entire set of country uh, program beneficiaries, all the ex-combatants ex that had received uh, reintegration support. Um, and in most countries where we were working at that time, uh, I think there was something really positive happening. It's kind of the ideal model how we think DDR and reintegration support looks. In that, as I said, you know, 
at the start of reintegration, we see that ex-combatants have a significant disadvantage uh, to community members. And, you know, conflict ends, uh, you know, there's a peace dividend, you know, economies start going, uh, people start moving. Uh, there's a lot of hope about what's going on. We see the communities go on this upward trajectory. Things are getting better, right? And ex-combatants over time are also going upwards. They're also benefiting from that peace dividend. But with reintegration support, this additional support that they're getting, they're able to close the gap, right? So they're moving up and the space between uh, uh, communities and ex-combatants reintegratedness is really shrinking. And that's kind of the ideal. That's how we think it's supposed to work. Uh, but what we also saw in some settings, uh, for example, in DRC, where while large scale international conflict had stopped, uh, a multiplicity of more interrelated local conflicts with transnational dimensions, you know, kept burning. So uh, in DRC, there was this kind of continued context of, of local insecurity and violence. And in that setting, what we saw was that, okay, it's true, ex-combatants still start disadvantaged communities, but the, the space between them at the start was much smaller. Over time, what we saw that there was no peace dividend, there's no bounce back for communities. They're on a slow, slight trajectory of decline. And ex-combatants who are getting a little bit of support, they close the gap, but the delta meets at one point, and then there's kind of a, an end of the possible trajectory of improvement. And I think it poses a lot of really kind of deep questions that I hope we can pick up in the conversation here afterwards about what does what is successful reintegration programming? Are there uh, differences between a successful reintegration experience, the lived experience, and a successful reintegration programming outcome? Are those always the same thing? I think there's evidence to support the idea that they're not always the same thing. Um, but I think it's really interesting because this ties back around to what Gaho was presenting here uh, at the beginning of the of the session, right? We we see that. Um, Today, in the settings where we work, it is settings like Eastern DRC. It is settings uh, with, um, with um, ongoing protracted conflict, a mul multiplicity of armed groups with transnational dimensions, organized crime, possibly terrorist designations. All of these issues drastically complicate the endeavor of supporting uh, individuals in this process uh, that they themselves navigate with or without support. Um, and I think that I will stop there because there's so many issues that are really interesting to discuss here, so many points. Um, but I hope we can pick up some of these uh, in the discussion afterwards. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Randolph. Thank you um, to all of our panelists for really um, in-depth and fascinating discussion. Um, there's lots of questions that I have. I'm not going to abuse that privilege and go straight in. I will prioritize the questions that have come in from our audience. Just for those of you that have, have joined us a little bit later, if you have any questions, you need to put them in the Q&A box um, and then I'll put them to the panel. If they're for, for a person in particular, please specify that the person you would like me to address the question. Otherwise, I'll assume it's, it's up for grabs um, and uh, it could be claimed by any of the panelists. So um, I, will, I will go through some, a couple of questions to start with, and then we'll come back to the others. Um, there's a question here from someone about whether DDR has um, done a, a better job in its more recent and, and um, updated conceptions of dealing with children born in, in, in conflict. And they give the example of the Lord's Resistance Army, for example. Um, so it'd be interesting to hear generally how DDR is, at least on paper, if not in practice, um, dealing with that issue. Um, there's another question here by G. Leslie, and perhaps Crystal, you would want to address this one in particular, um, about whether the change in the Colombian government has affected the peace process um, and, and the, the broader process of reintegration. Perhaps for the rest of the panel, that might be a broader question about how the permissive environments are related to the political context of the day, and, you know, in the DRC and elsewhere, you know, how important is it that there is um, that kind of permissive political context and, you know, how effective are um, programs and other interventions at dealing with that at the community level. Um, if you want to, Crystal, start off with, with that question on Colombia and then um, 
maybe touch on the question of children and anyone else who would like to answer, um, please follow on from Crystal. Sure, thanks, Karen. Um, so yeah, it's a great, I mean, it's a great question. I think, um, um, you know, there was, there was a lot of uncertainty just generally around implementation of the of the peace agreement when Duque took office, um, and and that uncertainty has has continued. And I think that um, throughout the kind of FARC, both the political party and more broadly the the former combatant um, population, there are um, there's just a lot of uncertainty about how um, how the current government approaches their legal status, um, how much resource there is for implementation of reincorporation. Um, on the transitional justice side, there have been a few um, attempts by the by the government to modify the transitional justice system um, in a way that that many think is not entirely coherent with um, how it's thought out in the peace agreement. Um, so I think I think broadly it's it's a sort of general kind of uncertainty about the the, the current government approach to to implementation of the peace agreement. Um, I think in terms of direct effects on, on reincorporation, um, the government's placing a lot of emphasis on, on economic reincorporation and the, and the productive projects. Um, and, um, and I think it's under a lot of pressure to, to, um, to make those projects work, but also doesn't have the, the resources. I mean, COVID has obviously impacted the, the Colombian economy and in, in similar ways to how it's a, a impacted economies around the world. So the, so the government doesn't have a huge amount of resource to commit to, um, to reincorporation um, and certainly not at the scale that I think was expected um, as, as the peace process was developing and, and as envisioned in the, in the final agreement. So there's been, a, there's been an emphasis on, on, on the economic side, um, perhaps to the detriment of, of other kind of more psychosocial um, and broader um, aspects of, of reincorporation. Um, so I think, but but I do think think that the the, the government has has shown commitment to um, to continuing re reincorporation. Um, I think the the biggest problem is probably just the the uncertainty around um, if further attempts will be made to to modify as aspects of implementation. Um, on the question about children, so it's a really interesting. I think it's a really interesting question. Um, in in Colombia, there are fewer cases of of children who were born. Um, within the armed groups, who are still with the the former members of the armed groups, there was um, there were quite strict rules, unfortunately, against um, against having children within the armed groups. But there's been a baby boom um, among among the former combatant population since the peace agreement, um, which is it's it was initially seen, and I think still as a as a kind of reason for optimism um, that people were leaving. The FARC and, and they were kind of part of their part of their transition into civilian life was really kind of creating families and putting down roots, um, and so and so a lot of the of, of the um, kind of government and, and UN efforts around um, supporting those individuals making the transition to civilian life is is around ensuring that their families are also supported and that there is um, that efforts are made to support uh, the children that have been born since since they left the armed group. Um, but I know that in other in other contexts it's different. So I'll I'll let others on the panel um, answer that question as well. Thanks. Yeah, I don't know if anyone would like to go, uh, Siobhan. Yeah, I'll jump in on that and just say a couple things. Um, I mean, I think historically DDR programs have not necessarily been oriented to um, ensure that women and their and, and girls and their sort of very varied associations with armed groups were, were covered or eligible. Um, and in some of the efforts to make sure that they would have a safe space, that they would be eligible, um, they haven't always necessarily ended up with people having that safe space to, to um, be involved. I'm thinking of Somalia when we did some work there and some of the requirements to have a separate space, but there wasn't a separate space led to women being locked out or we having day programs. And so it is not something we've, we've been particularly good at. I know there's a real effort now to make sure that we can have more gender sensitive programs, more accessible programs. Um, Plan International is, is undertaking a huge effort right now, particularly around girls. Um, to see that programming could be adapted to their needs, which is, is really needed. So that's really good. One thing just to say on this very specific issue of people coming out with children that they didn't go in with. Um, 
this is an area where I think we need to not only just think of, of short-term programming, but also sort of long-term support structures for people who um, may have not had those children uh, by, their own, um, by their own will. And so I'm thinking specifically of, of Iraq. Um, so one of the challenges here is, is how those children are recognized or not. And that's not necessarily for the UN, but it might be more of an advocacy role. Um, and so in that particular case, you have people coming out with birth certificates and marriage certificates from Islamic State that are not recognized by the Kurdish regional government or by the Iraqi government. That creates a huge cascade of effects for them, right? So that means you cannot, I mean, first of all, it means they are illegal um, because they've been had out of wedlock. Um, it makes the women illegal. Uh, it makes it impossible to access school and medical care and other social services. So we are potentially creating a cycle where a lot of young people um, will really struggle moving forward. That, that's not a good situation for anyone. So I think we need to, to uh, find a way to address some of these sort of structural challenges to, to women coming out with children, but do it in a way that is responsive to their needs and recognizing those needs might change over time. So, you know, there's one of the challenges here, particularly for girls coming out with children, is we're potentially recognizing forced marriages. So there's, there's a real sort of resistance to getting too involved with that. And yet, we may be creating enormous challenges for them if those marriages are not recognized. Um, so I think having a flexible approach, one that, that is responsive to the needs of the individual, and those will vary by person, um, and also one that will, will change over time. So what a, a girl with a child or a woman with a child needs in this moment now, it may be very different three years from now. And we have to have some flexibility built in the system to adapt to those changing needs. So just a, a quick comment there. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to ask uh, three questions, um, three different speakers um, to get through some of these. Um, so um, for Randolph specifically, perhaps you could talk more about uh, one of the questions here about how ex-combatants leveraged familial trust and acceptance at the community level. Um, and they're asking in particular for, for any published research or recommendations. Um, we have a question from, um, from Kay Neil Jenkins as well. Um, Kato, okay, perhaps you can speak a little bit more about the methods that you used with the telephone interviews. Um, um, obviously, you, you, you stated that these are preliminary findings, but nonetheless, they are really interesting statistics. But how did the different methods and the challenges around um, how it was undertaken affect the answers, uh, kind of, I guess, about strengths and limitations of that approach? Um, Henry Levinson has a question, um, which uh, Gaho, I would hope that you might be able to address initially, at least, but perhaps the rest of the panel also wants to comment on. He talks about Ethiopia having had a series of DDR processes, but now um, returning to violence. And the question really is, at what point do researchers of DDR start a post-mortem of the DDR process in countries that return to conflict? At what point, I guess, does, is it accepted that a DDR process is, is completely derailed? Um, so if we, um, if we, if we start with, um, I think it was Randolph I, I came to first, and we'll move through those. Great. Yeah, I can touch on that point of uh, familial networks and community networks. Um, and I hopefully also can just comment briefly on the issue of uh, child reintegration as well. Um, so starting with familial networks. Now, my all I used to know all the figures and exactly in my head perfectly and could just cite off numbers like crazy. Uh, but I have to go with vagueness now instead. Um, uh, Yes, familial networks as a symbol of uh, trust and acceptance, uh, a shift in identity, and the most clear pathway through which this uh, is observably uh, transferred into broader communal networks is through marriage. Um, and it's really interesting to look at because there's a really clear gender dimension here as well. Uh, because we see, if you ask, you know, uh, community members and ex-combatants about their various uh, attitudes about marrying, uh, you know, non-combatants or um, ex-combatants, uh, you know, it's pretty stark that nobody wants to marry a female ex-combatant, but there's you know, some wiggle room with male uh, ex-combatants. Um, and so that those who are able to return to a family network uh, and that family's broader set of connections uh, can often find their way into a situation and where it's possible to marry, build an extended familial network, and that that's really the gateway into broader communal uh, social networks. Um, what's the policy implication here? It's not get everybody married. That's not what it's about. It's about what it symbolizes. 
um, it's trust and acceptance. Um, and I think that, you know, a lot of my earlier work actually course, uh, triangulates some of the points that Crystal, or I'm sorry, Kato was bringing up earlier um, about, um, you know, if you ask people beforehand, you know, or do you fear the return of ex-combatants? They all pretty uniformly say, yes, we're very worried about ex-combatants returning to our community. If you ask them, you know, a year or three years after ex-combatants have returned, how do you view ex-combatants as uh, in your community? They're more likely uh, than not to describe them as the positive uh, contribution to the community uh, and that uh, there's an increased level of trust there. Um, so it's really this kind of slow, cathartic process of doing things together, of being exposed to each other. Um, and marriage is just one embodiment of that. If I can really just brief up uh, published, it's out, it's, it's out there in World Bank documents on the internet. I don't know where they are these days. They used to all be on the tdrp.org uh, website, which doesn't exist anymore. But in the World Bank uh, knowledge repository, if you Google reintegration, uh, you know, you'll, you'll find it. Um, on the issue of children's reintegration, I think one big thing that we often uh, that often happens that uh, or or that one reason why DDR practitioners often haven't had to deal with this issue as as much as they might is that you know recruitment of children is a war crime and armed groups know this uh, so that as soon as they're you know uh, thinking about the process of entering into some kind of DDR program they send all the kids away. They say, no, no, we don't have any children, mm -mm, none here. Uh, and so that yeah, all these individuals may not formally exist within DDR support, but they certainly are navigating these processes of reintegration themselves. Um, and I think it's a really gray line between adult and child as well, because we end up with this over under feature, right? There are some who are under this line of 18 or sometimes under the line of 16, uh, depending on which legal uh, uh, frameworks we're working in, um, who they may be legally a minor, but are coming into a DDR process, perhaps uh, married, maybe with a ch child or multiple childs, maybe they've been a commander. Uh, they're coming with all of this life experience where chronologically they are a child, uh, but their position within an armed group has been as an adult. And it's a, a really tough transition uh, to treat that in a in a post conflict conflict environment. Likewise, th this is one of my actually my my pet projects is this whole invisible demographic, which is those who are uh, mobilized as children but demobilized as adults uh, because they're over the line of sixteen or eighteen, but they carry some of the huge challenges uh, that child soldiers do. The same challenges, but they get no specific support for those because they're over this line. Uh, so it's a really tricky issue. And there's a spectrum of perspectives on how to approach that. There are really hardline child protection advocates who are on one side, and they say, you can't even put the words DDR and child together unless you're saying there is never DDR and children together. There's that perspective. And then you know, there's maybe some middle ground where we say there is a parallel approach to release, return, and reintegration of children that needs to be coordinated intact with uh, a DDR process um, because they're obviously related to each other. Um, I'll stop there for now on those two points and turn over to the others. Katso, I think on, on the Nigeria methods. Telephones. Should I just jump right in on the Nigeria methods or did anyone else want to jump in on Randolph's great points? I, th I think oh. if you can speak on methods now, okay. we're, we're, we're Perfect. Time, so yeah. Um, I think there were several questions in here. So the, the telephone calls were made from my degree actually by a a local team of enumerators in Hausa and Kanuri. All of our surveys, I should mention, are going to be uh, published as kind of public public goods um, once they've been kind of tested, contextualized um, a little bit further. We're aiming to add Shua Arabic as well for some of our other surveys, uh, but we're still working on that translation. Um, I should also just mention that this telephone survey was partly done because of COVID-19. Um, we had always, one of our goals with the MIAC project had always been to find ways of, of doing uh, research or assessment with people in hard to reach areas, which is in any conflict setting, right? But COVID really pushed us to, um, to do this kind of faster and in a larger uh, scale way. So it was a two layered 
kind of introduction to respondents. We wanted to initially buy phone lists that was not possible in, we didn't, we couldn't find phone lists uh, that were, were really good enough. So we ended up recruiting our own sample. Um, we did a kind of randomized household uh, outreach with very short in-person kind of intake interviews to ask people if they wanted to be part of a research uh, sample and then from there we randomly call people so i think that really helped with the response rate because the team that did the participant recruitment already had a chance to kind of explain the MIAC project and the goals of the project uh, and then again when we would call them for the interview we would of course have a, a elaborate kind of consent script which again would run through the the goals of the project um, in addition, specifically on the question on whether people were ever with an armed group, this is the exact question that one of our research partners had already uh, used in previous in-person research. And she, I think, Siobhan, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think she found slightly higher rates. And so in, in the near future, um, if COVID allows it, we're going to do this in person as well. And so that will be very kind of interesting because then we'll really be able to compare how a phone uh, survey elicits maybe different responses than, than an in person um, survey. On the team of enumerators, we have our own kind of team of, of enumerators on the ground who are doing several uh, surveys for us. We're working with Mohamed Bukhar, who's a really, really excellent and experienced enumerator. For this specific flash survey, uh, we, uh, we also work with IPA as an implementing partner. Um, so they helped us in conducting this survey from, from my degree. I'm trying to see what else I missed. Um, I think we can, we can leave it there. There's probably um, yeah. a lot and, more. Detail to yeah. And I'm happy, happy, of course, to have a separate conversation on this and, and have more, um, do more details. Yeah. More details. Great. Thank you. That's all. Um, Gaho, that, that question about when we should pronounce a DDR program um, effectively dead. Um, did you want to comment on that? Yeah, no, I'm happy to do so. Um, and, you know, looking at the question, and it's a good question, um, uh, because, you know, I, I, I will use it to emphasize a point that I made earlier, because key assumption here is um, that the, the reason why we're, we're seeing the, the Tigray crisis currently play out is because previous DDR efforts uh, between 2013 and 16, but also 1991 and 97, following the fall of the dirt, failed. So that's an assumption that I I would not um, you know I would not agree with. Um, I think the TIG their their um, historical and you know political um, broader historical political reasons for what we're seeing in the Tigray crisis right now, and they are certainly to a certain degree maybe related to you know incomplete. Um, the uh, efforts of, of the past or, um, uh, you know, implications of, of the uh, processes of the past. But certainly I would not make that direct, direct link to say that um, because of the, the, the implications or, or even shortcomings of previous DDR processes, we're seeing the TGRI crisis play out as, 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 we're, as, as it's playing out right now. Um, of course, and I'll, I'll be more you know, I'll zoom out of Ethiopia uh, just to make the point that, you know, of course, incomplete DDR processes, um, you know, they can either, um, you know, uh, they, they can lead to new grievances um, amongst, you know, the, the, the beneficiaries or even communities that have been involved. They can lead to, you know, um, uh, fueling existing grievances. Um, or, and of course, uh, given that you have these former you know, ex-combatants um, somewhat in limbo in their communities. Of course, this increases the, the, the potential for mobilization or remobilization along, you know, these, these, these past or new grievances. Certainly that is a factor that can play into, you know, renewed crisis. But um, I would really um, avoid, and this is something that I see a lot exactly in academic literature that, you know, scholars zoom into the DDR process and then you know, center everything that happens in a specific context when it comes to, um, uh, you know, conflict dynamics on that DDR process. But um, I think the lens needs to be a different one. The, 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 in the end, we're looking, you know, we're dealing with a political crisis, right? And I think the lens, you know, you need to look at what is being done to address 
this political crisis at, at the political level. And yes, as I, as I put it earlier, DDR can contribute to that. But DDR should really not be seen, you know, as an end in itself. Um, it needs to be driven by, you know, by this by, by this political strategy. So I would hope that, you know, um, maybe going forward we can see um, scholars better analyzing this this link between, you know, um, political conflict resolution approaches and how DDR evolved um, or was was used in this context, rather than zooming into the DDR process and then highlighting all the, 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 the flaws, which you are, you, you will find. Um, but uh, in most cases where I think um, DDR has been, has been uh, declared as a failure, the real failure was a conflict resolution failure. And it manifested itself in the way that DDR um, played out. And, you know, th this can be due to different um, reasons. This can be due to the fact that um, there was a, you know, there was no concrete link between DDR and the conflict resolution strategy. And, you know, this is something that even within the UN, you know, we keep on, you know, sensitizing our leadership saying that if you see armed groups in a specific context, don't jump to the conclusion that you can just simply DDR them because these armed groups have concrete political, um, uh, social, economic grievances that need to be addressed. So before you even talk about DDR, think about how you want to address those. And then, you know, the practitioners, the DDR practitioners will work something out for you um, once you've, you, you've, you've established that framework. At the same time, um, and this is something that was mentioned earlier, there's also the issue of political will at the national level, you know, by the government. Um, is there really a commitment uh, for DDR or is it just, you know, um, something that, you know, it, it, a, a rhetoric that is used maybe even to appease international um, uh, supporters um, uh, on, on, on this aspect. And also another, um, another point is even where we have a political will to move forward with DDR, a, a challenge that we keep on running into is that there is a lot of focus put immediately on programming, resource mobilization, etc. But the, the most important point once, you, once political will has been established is to come up with a solid policy framework that will guide um, uh, DDR uh, processes, um, including support by international actors. So um, I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it here, but the key point is don't see DDR in isolation um, and don't apply for the policymakers or practitioners that are, might be listening, don't apply DDR, you know, as, a, as an end, you know, don't see it as an end in itself, don't apply it in isolation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, that's probably a good point to finish just because we have to finish, unfortunately, um, with a with a, a good broad contextualization of what DDR can and can't do, or should be expected to do. Um, there are lots more questions that I had, and there, there are some really great questions that we didn't get around to. So apologies to our audience for that. I think the best way to deal with that um, is to have you all back. Um, it would be really great to have a, a, another panel further down the line when, when you know some of the research has progressed and dare I say it, maybe even after the pandemic is over, um, when, when you know, some of these uh, findings might have been followed up with in-person research. Um, but thank you, really, really thanks to our, our speakers today, our panelists. Um, there's so much expertise and knowledge on this panel that we, we've only scratched the surface of what we'd like to discuss. Um, but thanks for taking the time um, and thank you to our audience for your questions. Um, and um, yeah, we hope to see you all soon and best of luck with the research project as you go. Thank you. Thanks, Karen. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, everyone. Thanks so much. Karen.